All right. All right. Well, welcome everybody. We're going to give, of course, as usual, give everybody just a minute to get themselves settled, get in and to the Zoom, and we'll get started here in just a couple of minutes. Excited to see who joins us for our last episode of the year. Time flies when you're having sustainable fun. <laughs> that is what I always I'm say. <laughs> I can't believe it's already been a whole year. This is uh, closing out year two of Sustainable in the City. So oh, wow. very exciting, exciting stuff. Very, very exciting. So people are usually moving a little bit slower in December. We're getting and it's tired. Rainy today. It's been raining for seven years straight. <laughs> very <Everyone's> gloomy. <laughs> feeling gloomy, but we're feeling sunshine inside of our hearts. I know that. I know this audience. I know we're feeling good. We're going to rock this episode. We are so excited to answer some of the questions that you all submitted. We're going to tie up some loose ends, some things that are lingering in your minds about sustainability. And we're going to send you off into the new year with lots and lots of resources. So I'm very, very excited for this episode as well. As always. I've never not been excited for an episode. So I'm a little bit of like cry excited. Um, <laughs> give folks All right. Where's my? I think we're. I think we're good. Let's let's get going. Awesome, awesome. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for taking uh, an hour or maybe even less this this time uh, out of your December afternoon. We know that this time can be wild for folks for lots of different reasons. Um, and so we really do appreciate you taking your time um, and spending and spending it with us and learning about sustainability. Um, so as a reminder, this is Sustainable in the City. This is a partnership between uh, Jen's organization, Zero Waste Nashville, my organization, uh, Urban Green Lab, and we talk about all things sustainable in Nashville. And today we are going to be talking about your questions um, that you submitted um, to kind of tie up some loose ends from some of the things that we've talked about throughout the year, a wonderful year it has been. Um, and we're going to make sure that you go off into the new year um, with all the resources that you could that you could need um, on your sustainable journey. Um, so, Jen, things are going to be a little bit different this time because, again, we're keeping it a little bit more casual. We're keeping it a little loose this episode. Um, we want you guys to get to know us a little bit more, maybe see us talking <laughs> a little bit more. Um, so there's going to be a little bit of a different um, uh, chat format. So why don't you explain uh, to the folks what they can expect in this episode? Yeah, so um, you're absolutely right. Definitely keeping it more casual today. And so we have eliminated the Q&A. So normally we have a guest, we have panelists, um, and that Q&A feature allows us to uh, pull your questions as you have them for those panelists. But today, we've already asked you to give us your questions. So um, we are going to cover those, or as Christina said, we're going to um, share a lot of resources to hopefully provide you more space to get more questions answered as you go. So we're not going to do the traditional Q&A that we normally do. So you'll see that feature is gone. We just have our chat. Um, but what we do have here today, I'm very excited to share, is Miss Allie Omens. She is part of the Zero Waste National Team, but she is also a brand new part of the Sustainable in the City team. So excited to have her here today. You're going to see a lot more of her in 2023 as well. And she's going to be helping us out. She's going to pop in here um, a little bit with our, our Q&A as we go along, but she's also going to be our main point person in the chat. So um You'll see her popping in links as we go along because we've got a lot of good stuff to share with you. Um, if you have any technical questions, feel free to ask her those there. And as always, continue to share and chat with everyone in that chat function. So when you do open that little bubble, um, that little talking bubble that says chat, make sure and where it says two, um, there's going to be a little drop down box and you want to make sure that drop down box says everyone. So you are chatting with everyone. Uh, both all three of us love to hear what you have to say, but we want to make sure that everybody is hearing what you have to say if you're trying to share resources um, or if you're uh, wanting to ask questions to your fellow audience members. Um, all right. So with that, I think 
we can go ahead and jump right in and get started. What do you say, Christina? Let's do it. Let's rock and roll. So we're going to talk about um, some of the episodes that we have been um, talking about for this entire year. And so we're going to show um, Urban Green Labs YouTube channel, because um, a lot of folks always ask us, um, are you going to record this and send this out? Is there a way to see an episode that we haven't seen? Um, sometimes we reference episodes that we've kind of talked about things um, in the past. And so we just want to kind of show you all um, how to navigate through that Urban Green Lab um, YouTube channel. And also, hopefully, you'll, you'll do a little follow and subscribe um, and get our numbers up and you also get kind of notifications of when we have new videos. Before we get any further, I forgot to say one thing. I had some surgery recently on my tooth and jaw and sinus cavity. Um, and so if I sound like I have a retainer in my mouth or if I look pained, um, that is why. So I apologize in advance. I hope that once I get kind of started, um, my normal voice will kick in and <laughs> it maybe won't sound so much like I have a retainer, um, but all is well. I just wanted you to know um, in case that was distracting for you. Um, so great, thank you so much, Jen, for sharing that. So. This is our Urban Green Lab YouTube channel. I really recommend that you subscribe to that. We have lots of different things that we put up um, over the year, but mostly this is used for how we house our old Sustainable in the City episodes. And so you'll see that we have it by season. Um, and so if we click on season two, um, you'll be able to see all of the different episodes that we've actually had um, throughout the year. And something, and you'll see a little oh. sc uh, screen of Jen. Um, and so, <laughs> What we want to do is kind of get you acquainted for this um, and just know that we'll always be putting these videos up on that YouTube channel. Um, so you can always make sure that you can go back, you can get that um, information that you need, um, go back and see all the great jokes that Jen and I make um, and, and feel like you know how to navigate that. And so we want to hear from you. Um, what were some of the episode topics that you really enjoyed this year? So we're going to try something a little bit new this year um, or this episode. We're going to do a Menti cloud, a word cloud on Menti. Um, and so kind of thinking about um, some of the episodes that we've had. So, you know, can Tennessee green its grid, um, communicating for sustainable change. I forgot about that one. It was amazing. That's a good one. Um, yeah. <laughs> unpacking our recycling services. Um, we talked about trees. We talked about community gardens. Um, we talked about lots and lots of things. So what I want you to do is just think back on one of one or two of your favorite topics that you had um, throughout the year and let us know on this word cloud. Um, so we are going to send that out in the chat. Um, you should also be able to just go to Menti and type in that code that you see at the top of the screen. Um, so it'll be in the chat and also on the screen. Um, you can go to menti.com and um, Jen, we want to make sure oh, we're showing the first question. Yes. Oh. So what was your favorite 2022 SITC topic? So it could be as simple as just writing the word trees, if that's what you were interested in, um, or you can write the whole title if you happen to have that, if you're looking at that YouTube channel. Um, so we would love to hear from you. Hopefully you'll send those in. Yes. Can you show the topics while we are trying to do this? Yes, we did send the YouTube I have, channel, but let us hold see. on. I have an idea. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna try something here. Ooh. Don't look too far ahead. I've got all our tabs open for later. <laughs> got some legalese in the background there. You don't want to be looking at that yet. Hold <laughs> on. Here we go. Okay. So maybe that'll help. These are awesome. some of our options. But feel free to just put in anything that really like grabbed your attention over the past um, over the past year of all the different things that we've been talking about. Anything at all that really just you felt was uh, some of your favorite moments, things you really enjoyed hearing about, things you learned new. We talked about urban heat islands. We talked about our grid. We talked about sustainable design empowering youth and community that was with recycle and reinvest communicating for sustainable change if there was a topic that you love from 2021 that's a-okay julia you can put that in as well we're interested in hearing anything we don't expect you to memorize which season everything was was in getting outside and into community we talked about trees talked about our sustainability plan 
And if folks are having problems with the uh, word cloud, no problem. We're just trying it out. If it's not working for you, shoot it in the chat. We're keeping it real casual today. So we do have in the chat, I see uh, Willie like season two, episode six. So that was uh, unpacking Nashville's recycling. Always a hot topic. Yep. We'll be getting to that in just a second. Um, sewage going to manure. So yeah, we did have, I think you're right though. I think that was a 2021 episode, but we did talk about um, Metro Nashville's wastewater treatment. And here we go, popping up on the screen. Um, Metro Nashville's uh, wastewater treatment system and how that is turned into a class A biosolid uh, fertilizer, which is really um, incredibly sustainable, something that they've been doing for a long time. Um, what we've got up here, we've got recycling, communicating, urban heat islands. Oh, okay, here we go. We're going to shimmy this over here. I'm trying to show all of it at once. It's not working too well. Maybe we can get rid of the YouTube part. All right, we are moving the YouTube back in here. Excellent. Okay, so it looks like urban heat islands. That one... I know we are incredibly excited to hear more about the urban heat islands. Hadn't really hit that topic at all when we finally got to it. So it was really exciting to be able to share that this year. Um, we hadn't gotten to anything about that in uh, in our first uh, in our first season of episodes. Trees, food waste. Yeah, we definitely did some episodes on food waste for sure. Youth, awesome. We got the word cloud going. It's beautiful. It's colorful. It's beautiful and powerful. Building right. construction was was last year. Definitely. Awesome. So I'm glad that y'all are, you know, you're thinking back to 2021. You're this is just like you're not even thinking about whether or not it was season one or season two. You just know these were good topics and you were excited to hear more. So we'll give you a little teaser that we're going to do this again at the end to hear more about what you want to hear more about in 2023. So you can kind of start thinking about that um, as we move through this episode. Um, but one of the things that we we often see, and it's right there, I'm actually surprised it's not the number one thing, um, <laughs> is, is recycling. And so a lot of the questions that we got from y'all um, were, were on recycling. And so just as a reminder, this episode is from kind of pre-sent um, in questions from the audience. So these are questions that we kind of gathered and synthesized and tried to pull out um, kind of exactly what was trying to be uh, asked um, from multiple people. Um, so we're not going to kind of read out the exact wording of these questions. We're really just going to kind of do them in kind of buckets and themes um, as we move through. And like we said, really just trying to focus on giving you resources so you can keep up this journey of learning um, while we're kind of off for maybe January and then we come back in February. Um, so Jen, our yeah. in-house recycling resident and, and expert um, is going to, to start us off and, and kind of get us in some of those questions we had about recycling. So hit it, Jen. All right. Yes. Uh, of course, my one of my favorite topics to talk about. Um, and as Christina said, uh, we could spend a whole hour and a half, two hours, three hours talking about the nuances of what we're recycling, what we're not recycling. So what I'd rather do today is provide you with some resources about how you can learn more, give you kind of high a high level overview, um, but ultimately send you in a direction where you can get a lot more detailed information than we'll be able to share in today's episode. So um, we did get a lot of just those general questions about what and how we're recycling. Um, so first off, I'm gonna pull up our website as we go along. There's a lot of controls to, to deal with today. This is a, so bear with me as we pull this up. Um, okay, so this is our, um, our well, it's the Get Rowdy Recycle. This is Nashville's recycling page, so recycle.nashville.gov. Ali will put that in the chat for you, um, but this is a great homepage for you to start off with in terms of learning what we can and cannot recycle. Um, so basically, in general, I'm going to scroll down to the bottom because there's a lot of good resources at the top, but here's, here's the main stuff, paper and cartons. So if it looks like paper, talks like paper, walks like paper, if it tears like paper, put it in your recycling bin, you're good to go. Um, we do also accept soup cartons, um, uh, milk cartons, juice cartons, things like that as well. Cardboard, snack boxes, all of that stuff. 
any of those fiber products for metal. We accept food and drink cans, really just talking about packaging materials. So not scrap metal, but food and drink cans like your soda cans, your tuna cans. Plastic is always the big question. So we do have, um, and Allie will pop this in the chat, it's probably out of order uh, for her in the list of links that I gave her. But uh, we do have an episode all about just plastic recycling. Um, so we actually did that twice for Sustainable in the City, but it really goes into the details of why these plastics, why not other plastics, how the whole infrastructure system works from getting your plastic bottle all the way down the line turned into plastic carpet. Because recycling really is all about making sure that when you put something in that, that uh, your Kirby cart, your green recycling cart container, or if you take it to a drop off, when you put it in that bin, that ultimately it comes out the other end as another good or product. Um, that's really the true recycling is when it makes it all the way through that process, not just putting it in the right bin. So when it comes to plastics, check that um, resource out, but ultimately just remember bottle jars and jugs. So if it's got a wider base and a narrower neck, um, it looks like a bottle, it looks like a jar, it looks like a jug, put it in your container, everything else right now, um, go ahead and leave that out. And I really, we really, really advocate, don't wish cycle. Don't put something in, you're not sure that it can be recycled. If it's a bottle jar jug, great. If you're good to go, feel confident in that. Leave everything else out because those plastics are the quality plastics that are getting recycled. So that's the basics. But even better is at the top of this page, we have our Nashville Waste and Recycling app widget, and it is automatically set to the wizard feature. Um, so this feature is incredibly handy. So if you're not sure, like a uh, bottle jar jug, I just, it's too much for me. Totally get it. Recycling is super complicated because packaging is complicated. Packaging went from, you know, back in the day when we had newspapers and we had, you know, Coke bottles that were made of glass. Now we have so many different forms of packaging and especially plastic packaging that I don't expect everybody to get it. It's, it's, it, I don't always know. I have to go and ask questions and I have to do research and it gets complicated. So what we wanted to do is make it easier for you by using a tool that you can search items. So I'm going to show you how to do that. Down here, you can see our popular searches branches. So this also um, gives you information, not just about recycling, but about proper disposal. And it's not also um, just about recycling in your curbside cart. We have other recycling programs as well, especially right now it's the holidays. If you have broken holiday lights, do not put those in your recycling cart. Please do not put them in your recycling cart or recycling drop-off, but do take them to one of our e-waste recycling, electronics recycling locations. Um, so three of our convenience centers have that and we can recycle them through that program. But let's say, um, gosh, shampoo bottle. I'm not sure if my shampoo bottle, you start typing in shampoo, it's intuitive. So you're able to click, it even has, It'll pop up with different types of items. Um, so it is intuitive. You do need to click on that item, but then it's gonna pop up. It's gonna show you a picture nine times out of 10. Actually, I would say 99 times out of 100. There's very few that don't have a picture. If it doesn't have a picture, we're looking for one. Um, <clears throat> and then as you scroll down, it, the nice thing about it is that it tells you, okay, this is curbside recycling. I can take it to drop off recycling as well. So it'll tell you every single option that you really have. And at the bottom, we try to do this with um, most items is try to provide any additional information about how to recycle it properly. So it is a lot of information, but it's a lot of good information that will tell you exactly what you need to do with that material. Um, so scrolling back down. Um, oh, the other nice thing I love about it is that it shows if you're going to a drop off, if you plug in your address up here at the top, it'll show you your nearest location. Um, which is super handy. And uh, so let's look at another item. Let's say you're looking for a picture frame. Oh gosh, I don't see a picture frame in here. Um, that's because I don't put it in here because I use it as an example all the time to show you this. So I've looking, oh no, why did it go to scrap metal? Come on. Picture frame. We're going to search specifically for that picture frame. So if you don't find something that you're looking for, you can hit that search button and then you can come down here and you can suggest it as a new item. So this has about over 400 items in it right now, but we are actively growing that as people suggest new items um, or as we think of things that need to be added. 
So if there's ever something that's not in here, click on this button. We usually get to this about once a month. Um, and as we get more staff, we'll be able to check that even more regularly. Um, so just the, if you ever need something added to it, feel free to click there. So it's a really handy feature, really great way to just get those quick questions answered of whether or not you can recycle it. Um, and then also we have this super handy game. I love the game. You click play the game. And the game looks like Nashville. That's the Ryman back there. You can click on a level. It's very exciting. Paper towels, where does that go? Can I, comp I can compost paper towels. Don't put paper towels in your recycling though. So pizza, can I recycle pizza? Sure can't, um, but you can see it's a, it's a fun game. It's a great way to test your knowledge and it's different every single time. So you can play it over and over again. You also can get a fun certificate at the end. Um, so just a really great feature. You can get that both again on our website at recycle.nashville.gov, as well as um, you can download it. It's the Nashville Waste and Recycling app that you can download in your mobile store. So that's a really great way to get those answer, those questions answered about recycling. Additionally, um, we are going to host a live Recycle Right presentation. So we'll be doing that on January 5th at 11 a.m. Um, Allie's gonna put the link in the, um, in the chat to register for, for that event. We also have an on-demand webinar that if you want to do, um, if you wanna do that on demand, um, you can do that as well. So if you don't have time to be there for the live episode, it's about a 20 minute presentation that's been recorded. And then in the, uh, in the description of that on-demand webinar, there's also a little quiz that you can take as well. If you do the quiz, you get entered to win a t-shirt as well from us from uh, Zero Waste Nashville. But that live episode it'll uh, or live webinar will go for about an hour. We'll have time for more detailed questions. We'll also have videos showing how the process works how things get through the recycling facility and talk more in depth. So I really encourage you, if you've got more questions, go there, use these resources um, that can help you better understand our recycling program. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to know on recycling, uh, this is a little bit longer of a little recycling primer than I intended, but that's okay. Um, I also just wanted to mention, because we had a lot of folks ask about this plastics question and, and really whether or not they should be recycling plastics. Is it worth it to continue to recycle them? And I just wanna say, yes, it's just a matter of making sure you're recycling good plastic. So yes, you'll hear all the statistics, only like less than 9% of plastic is getting recycled. Um, that is true. There's a lot of plastic that's not getting recycled, but again, it's complicated. As I mentioned, there's all this new type of packaging that was never designed for the recycling infrastructure that we have here in the United States. Plastic bottles, plastic jars, and plastic jugs, they fit in that infrastructure. There are uh, facilities and processors that can chip that material up. They can melt it down, turn it into pellets, and make it into carpet, lumber, all these different new pl plastic, new plastic bottles all these different products. So it's just really important that yes, we can recycle some plastic. No, recycling is not the answer. We have to do a lot more and go above and beyond starting at the top level, starting at the federal level um, to really make better packaging on the front end. But when you do get that packaging, cause you're not gonna be able to avoid it at every single time, um, looking for packages that fit that bottle jar jug or that recyclability, um, and uh, just knowing that those materials, put those in your bin. They're getting recycled. They're being turned into new goods and products. Um, just make sure that all that other stuff that right now doesn't have an answer um, and doesn't have infrastructure for, keep that out. So that will be the end of my little recycling rant. But we've got more questions that are around recycling and waste. So I'm just going to keep on uh, jumping in and uh, hop into maybe a new rant. Um, so that was kind of the basics of like recycling questions that we had. But then we also had some great questions that folks were asking about. Um, oh, let me stop sharing my screen. Let, let me have you look at my face for a minute. Um, so we had some questions about um, legislation at the local level, state level, um, and potentially federal level around single use plastics um, and going above and beyond plastic. It's a great question, um, but it always leads me to have to inform everyone on the very, very sad story that um, us locally here in Nashville, one thing that we always have to do is look to the state level first and see what is in place there. And unfortunately, uh, there is a state ban on 
um, basically regulating any kind of container. So we cannot ban any type of packaging or containers. We cannot um, put a fee on any type of packages or containers. We cannot regulate them in any way as a local government in the state of Tennessee. So Allie's gonna put the legislation in there. I think it's um, HB 1021. Um, so that's the, the legalese that I had popped up. I don't know, we're not gonna sit here and read it, um, but I will just show and note for folks that, uh, so this is it. I actually have this bookmarked in my, uh, in my little toolbar here on Chrome. Um, but essentially it says, um, a local government shall not adopt, enforce a resolution, ordinance, policy, or regulation that regulates the use, disposition, that's actually not showing very well, but um, sale of uh, any of these containers, um, can enact a fee, um, it's not, it doesn't impact our recycling program. So it's good that they make that um, kind of distinction down here, but ultimately we can't ban single use plastic bags. We can't ban single use bottles. We can't um, do anything to, um, to kind of regulate those, those in any way as a local government. So, but what that does mean is that it's really something that, that lives at the state level. And that's kind of a bigger topic that I wanted to bring up is this interplay between local government, state government, and federal government. Um, some legislation and some policy makes the most sense to be at the local government level. Absolutely. That's stuff that we're looking at, that my team is looking at. But some of these, and especially when it comes to packaging, a lot of that legislation is more effective and better lives at the state level. So while, or the federal level, even better. Um, so the state level, for example, they could enact something where they ban single use plastic bags. It would just be across the entire state because this, um, this legislation is really only restricting local governments. Um, but it's something that we have to be aware of whenever we're looking at policy, whenever we're trying to move these sustainability initiatives, whether it's waste related or any other sustainability issue and move that forward, we have to look and see what are the politics that are going on? What is, what is the atmosphere like for moving something like this forward? For any of you that have been in Tennessee for a long time, paying attention to sustainability initiatives or just kind of any legis big legislation coming out of Nashville or some of the big cities, you might have noticed that occasionally the state will preempt um, uh, a lot, some legislation that comes out from a local government. So by that, I mean, they'll come back and say and enact something that then does not allow that local government to do what they're trying to do. Um, and that's really how the single use, um, how this packaging ban came about. The state did not wanna see piecemeal local government um, policy around single use plastics or around these packaging. And so they enacted something that was statewide that restricted that ability for us as a local government to do that. So whenever we're looking to move policy forward, whether it's plastic or otherwise, we really have to be mindful about um, how are people feeling at the state legislature about this? Is this something that we're gonna have to worry about or are those steps that we're gonna have to take to make sure that we're meeting the state government we're there at as well. Um, because ultimately we all have to be working together uh, to make these things work. Um, I also wanted to note um, in terms, cause I know there was some, uh, this was kind of a whole question around um, just in general plastics ordinances. And there was um, a specific mention of single use bottles. Um, which always brings up the question of the bottle bill. And yes, there have been many attempts to get a bottle bill passed uh, at the state level, um, which is the best place for something like a bottle bill. <clears throat> I will say, um, again, if you've been around, they have not really been able to move something like that forward. Uh, if, and for those that don't know what a bottle bill is, uh, essentially, it is uh, putting in the states where you see so many cents for returning your bottles, that's a, a way to incentivize people to return um, both plastic and glass bottles uh, with a financial incentive, essentially. Um, and then that money that goes, um, that is part of that helps manage the whole infrastructure. It's kind of set up a little differently in, in each state, but essentially you've got infrastructure that has to be put in place for people to be able to collect those bottles, um, process and manage those bottles, but it is a wonderful way to increase bottle recycling. Um, any state that has a bottle bill, you'll see that there is more 
they're capturing and collecting a lot more bottles than you'll see in any other state. Uh, so it is an, a, some, uh, an effective type of legislation, uh, but it is one that also then touches on kind of another aspect of policy. And that is beyond your government entities, beyond your, your local state and federal government, they're not the only ones that have a hand in policy. Um, you all know, you know, your vote counts for sure. But then you also have private industry, you have lobbyists that are coming in. And, and that's where we see the struggle with the bottle bill is a lot of bottle lobbyists and a lot of um, plastics lobbyists are, um, they're really invested in how that legislation moves forward. They're not, not all of them are necessarily against it. They just want to see it done in a way that's going to work for them. So there's just a lot that goes into trying to move some of this stuff forward. Hands are tied a little bit at the local level, but at the state level, we do see some potential. Um, and so with that, I think I've ranted maybe enough on all of that um, and hopefully answered some, some questions for folks um, about uh, just how, yes, we wanna move uh, issues around plastics forward, um, but for some of these single use things right now, Nashville in particular is just, uh, we've got to really work with the state and we do let them know every year, we let them know that this is an issue. We let them know that li this law is preventing us from being able to achieve the goals that, um, that we have set out in our zero waste master plan, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, same with the labeling law that they have. So it's a requirement to put the chasing arrow symbol on every piece of plastic packaging that's um, being sold in the state. So, and, and that's a real hindrance as you all know, um, recycling, that recycling symbol is really not an indication of recyclability. It is an indication of what that plastic is made from. And that's it. And so, but it's required by state law, which is why you see places like California, they just repealed. Um, they now have a truth and labeling law that prevents folks from putting that symbol, the chasing arrow symbol on any packaging that is not truly recyclable um, in California, which is pretty incredible. Sure. Ooh, and I think, I think Jen, um, before we hop into my part here, I just want to remind folks, please keep putting your questions and your comments to your conversation in the chat. I just want to be respectful and remind you that we are not going to be taking those questions live today. We kind of have a run of show um, with all those questions that we got um, ahead of time to make sure that we had resources to share. Um, so I don't want it to feel like we are ignoring any of those questions. Um, we'll, we'll go through the chat afterwards and see if that helps us plan for next year as well, if there's any kind of big um, ticket items that we're seeing co come up um, a lot. But I just wanted to kind of at this kind of halfway point, just remind folks who joined a little bit late um, that these are pre um, sent in questions from the audience um, and that we are making sure that we have some resources for. So we see your comments, we see them. Allie is um, answering them if she can um, real quick if they're kind of simple questions like when certain things passed. Um, but if they're kind of meatier questions, just know that we will, we will go through our chat afterwards um, and make sure that we are um, hearing from you. Uh, so just didn't want that to feel like they were just kind of falling on deaf ears. Um, and so what I want to talk about is not exactly with this bottle bill, um, but just kind of talking about the role of nonprofits sometimes um, when we're trying to make policy. And I think something that's really interesting about the work that my organization does, Urban Green Lab, um, and specifically with the work that we do with the Nashville Food Waste Initiative, um, is we partner with these other organizations. We have NRDC, which is kind of a national um, nonprofit. Um, and then we have um, ELI, which is the Environmental Law Institute, and they really help us build out um, this kind of model policy. And what model policy is, is kind of going back to what Jen said, which you have like lobbyists and folks who really want to see bills that are written in a way that kind of help put forward what they want to see um, in the legislature. Um, but we could also have nonprofits that write their own kind of model policies um, to make sure that the, the folks that, that we kind of care for in our community um, are also being, are being heard. And what's the nice about these model policies, and Jen, if you can share the, the, the screen for the purchasing for composting, um, is it basically just shows policymakers exactly how to lay this out 
um, so that if they want to, this is a, a model compost procurement policy. So basically creating a market um, for compost, which then makes it more accessible for cities to actually implement composting um, at the residential level because there is a market for it. So it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. Um, but what it does is it really shows you the language that you can use. It gives you resources and it's really what they call off the shelf um, policy. And so it's really great because it just shows how um, if, if we put the research into it, if we put the effort into it, um, that we can make it a little bit easier for policymakers to put forward um, what we want to see, because they not only need to see you know, the language that we want to see in these policies, but they also need to know from nonprofits that there is kind of like an active base that wants to see this work. Because I think we all know, like Jen was saying, that our vote matters, our voice matters. If, if policymakers know that this is something that their constituents want, um, they'll be more likely to put it in place. Um, so we just wanted to kind of show that this is something that we do in some ways. Urban Marine Lab is not a policy organization at all. We are an education organization, but we do work with the Environmental Law Institute and NRDC on specifically these food waste ones. Um, and just kind of showing how there are different roles of different folks um, to make policy. And so it's really digestible, it's recommendations. Um, and again, we really see the need for both top down and bottom up work um, when we wanna see these systemic changes that we really wanna see um, in Nashville um, and also um, in the state. And then beyond that, the role of nonprofits is really to educate the public on the need for these activities. So groups like Cumberland River Compact, Turnip Green Creative Reuse, Unearthing Joy, Recycle Reinvest. These are really wonderful groups that are working to make Nashville greener in their own little pockets. And that really pushes the needle on other larger things um, like policies since more people are aware of the issues. So just wanted to kind of put a finer point on kind of how the role of nonprofits plays into the larger policy um, conversation because we really can't do these things in silos. They all have to be kind of talking to each other. Um, and it's kind of like that sustainability Venn diagram of thinking about the economy, the people, um, and the planet. You really need to make sure that all of these interchangeable parts are kind of working together and, and getting their needs met um, to make sure that it's actual sustainable policy. Otherwise, if you kind of ram something through, um, some people might be really upset and then they'll try to repeal it. And then there's kind of like these battles that are going on. So really to make it the most holistic way possible, it's great to kind of tag in this idea of nonprofit education and kind of activism, if you will. Um, and then I just wanted to kind of zoom in a little bit more um, on what we're doing in, in Nashville and kind of that interplay of businesses, policymakers, government, and um, nonprofits. And so we have the Mayor's Sustainability Advisory Committee. And, and this really just kind of goes to show that sustainability is not just a plan. It's not just an idea. Um, people are really working towards it. Um, actual items in the city. And Urban Green Lab is one of those partners. Um, we are kind of sitting on all the different subcommittees that we have. And these subcommittees are, are things like youth and family, businesses, um, community, education. Um, and they're doing things like photo contests and student education, working with business community and how they can kind of pull action forward on maybe EVs or um, electric vehicles or other kind of bigger ticket sustainability efforts. And so it's pretty it's, it's pretty cool to see that they're actually kind of hiring people also for this. So we had in our first episode of this season, um, Kendra Abkowitz, the mayor's chief resilience um, and sustainability officer. And so she's really trying to be that person who's sitting in that kind of central spot and bringing all of these players together, right? So again, we can't have these silos. And so the fact that the city has this new position and this person who is not only knowledgeable and passionate, but really committed to making sure that folks are talking to each other and that these, these relationships are really being formed on a kind of a, an organic level um, and really holistically thinking about it. Um, just want you to know that this work is being done on the city level and it's being done kind of in all these different um, areas. Um, and one of the things, obviously, that's coming out of a lot of this work is the zero waste plan and just generally how do we implement that? What does that mean for the city? Um, and so I really want to encourage you to look at, you know, the reports that um, the mayor's sustainability advisory committee has, look at that first episode, kind of get acquainted with that and keep keep an eye out for that work. Um, but really, we want to kind of dive now into some of the questions that we got about the zero waste plan. Um, so we're going to we're going to turn that back to Jen and Jackie. she's going to start ranting again. <laughs> 
Uh, well, I'm, I also, I wanted to just really quick jump back and just really uh, uh, briefly mention with the compost procurement policies and these model policies that Urban Green Lab and, and um, the Environmental Law Institute has done, those are really wonderful ways for us to be able to to essentially expand our capacity. So as you may know, my team is very small. It's not a lot of folks that are trying to work on moving these things forward. And a policy like that, that particular one is one that the city has been able to take. We're looking at it. Um, I believe general services is working on piloting um, how that could be implemented. Cause that's also another big part of moving policy forward is we have to make sure that we have the capacity and ability to move something forward and that it makes sense for the city. So we've got a framework that we can start from um, that has been incredible, incredibly helpful that we can also then go back and um, I've looked over the policy and we've looked at, okay, what are these reporting requirements? How can we adjust this and modify this to make it something that'll work for Nashville? But also that is something that can work for other cities as well. And I just think it's a it's wonderful that we have um, well, thank you all for all the work that you do in doing that, Christina and, and Urban Green Lab and ELI, because it's it's incredibly helpful for us. So I did just want to mention that we are looking at that policy since it was the one as an example, because um, it is part of it is part of our zero waste master plan. Um, so first off, uh, before I jump too far, let me move to my next little tab here. Um, so we had a lot of questions around the zero waste master plan. Um, just trying to better understand because we've got kind of two things going on. We have this long term zero waste master plan that kind of feels like it's, you know, off in space. What does this really mean? Um, you know, cities put together a lot of plans while at the immediate, um, you know, future we have landfills. Um, it's been in the news. Murfreesboro Middle Point landfill is, is filling up. Our construction demolition landfill is not being expanded in, and is filling up. Um, so we have some real things and, and issues that we have to work through as, an, as a city, and that's those are immediate things. Um, so first off, just real quick, to show you the resource, for those of you that really want to dive into the Zero Waste Master Plan, um, we do it, have it on our website. We have, a, we have kind of a couple of different options here under the Solid Waste Master Plan. The complete document is what I call the whole enchilada. It's got all the appendices. It's got everything all put together. I really encourage folks to start though with the executive summary, maybe move into kind of the larger plan um, on the front end. So those are the two kind of prettier documents that really summarize all the work that was done um, in the zero waste master plan. Um, and then the appendices, that's the nitty gritty stuff. That's where I live, that's where my staff lives. Um, but those, these two top documents will really kind of help you understand where we're at, what we're trying to do, and kind of what the initial study and process was to get us to, um, to those goals. But I'm going to jump, I'm going to jump back really quick because I want to address this landfill issue and the concerns that folks are having around what's going on. Um, so, and, and concerns that we don't have any planning for the immediate future, um, because that's not the case. We do, this is not something that is a surprise. Uh, the zero waste master plan was developed because we knew these days were coming. We know that these landfills are filling up and that there's limited space. And also permitting new, new landfills is difficult. Um, not in my backyard, right? You don't want it in your backyard. No one wants it in their backyard. Um, and so permitting a new landfill is really difficult and we're just limited on that space, which is why we started looking back. Um, gosh, this process started... Um, it was at least started in 2016 is when they were doing a lot of the study work for this. So they've been looking at this for a long time um, to better understand how can we develop a plan to move away from disposal as the way that we manage our waste to uh, sustainable material, sustainable resource management, looking at our waste as resources. Um, and so the landfills that are filling up, I just wanna let everyone know in terms of Murfreesboro landfill, one, it's not the only landfill. Yes, there are other, you know, there's not necessarily a huge amount of capacity out there, um, but our contracts with the city, they are long-term contracts for a reason because we do have to plan for the future. We do have to plan for these changes that might happen. And so that long-term contract is with the transfer station. So a transfer station is where we take trash, kind of all of our trucks go there, they dump their material, and then all of that trash gets moved on to a bigger truck to go off to a landfill. And that contract is not necessarily for uh, middle point, it is for, they can take it to any landfill they want to, they just have to take it out of the county to a landfill. 
Um, so what that does mean though, is that we've got to start looking at landfills that are farther away. Um, so that is going to drive up costs and then those landfills are going to fill up. There's going to be, um, you know, some consequences as a result uh, of this that's really going to, I hope, I like to look at it as, uh, I think people get worried that their trash isn't going to get picked up and I feel that, but I also look at it as an opportunity to really force our region's industry into doing um, and creating more sustainable management options for this material. Um, so yes, we do have, um, we are absolutely looking at the immediate future in fact, people way above my pay grade are looking at this. Um, leadership at the mayor's office, leadership at Waste Services, it is something that is definitely on the radar, something that is our discussions that are happening um, both internally as well um, as, uh, as you know, with contractors and, and those that um, play a role in this. So um, right now, that contract, we're not, we're not looking at any issues. Um, until the term of our, you know, contract ends, and then we're going to be looking at um, at a new contract, and then we'll determine at that point we're going to be working well in advance of when that contract comes up to identify um, what we're looking for uh, to be able to continue managing the material. As absolutely right, somebody mentioned, yeah, I think in some of the emails, zero waste is not something that's going to happen overnight. This is something that is a long-term plan. So what exactly is our zero waste master plan? What are we trying to do? What's included in there? Um, so first off, we're mandated by the state to create a mass long-term master plan. This is um, this plan is actually the culmination of um, many years of in the past, we've looked at recycling, we've been pushing for more sustainable materials management. And finally, in 2019, um, the Solid Waste Region Board. So that is, I'm starting to get into the weeds. Let me pull back from the weeds a little bit, but it there was a push to go towards zero waste for Davidson County. Um, and so to really start moving, as I mentioned, a transition from disposal to managing our waste as resources. So that is what the zero waste master plan. It is our plan to reduce our reliance on middle point landfill, on landfilling in general. So this is how we go from our current immediate future to long-term um, more sustainable management. So it is about a 30 year plan. It is, was heavily researched. Um, a lot of public input was put into it. Um, and ultimately the plan identifies dozens of strategies, both in the near term, as well as in the long term of how we can move ourselves towards um, a larger waste diversion from landfill. So there's, um, they prioritized a lot of this um, information or a lot of these strategies actually they prioritized all of the strategies based on waste diversion. Um, and then people like Christina was talking about the Mayor's Sustainability Advisory Committee. They've actually also looked at all of these strategies and prioritized them based on uh, carbon emissions. So um, the plan itself, uh, you'll notice if you go in there and start looking, um, I'm not gonna pull it up because there's, there's so much in there. Uh, you should look at it um, when you have time on your own, but there's some top high priority strategies um, that are the most bang for our buck. So that's the way it's prioritized. So when people ask, okay, what are you working on? What are you working towards? Our top goals based on that prioritization and also based on the mayor's prioritization process, um, construction and demolition waste, um, food waste, as well as increasing recycling. So these are kind of in a, in a nutshell, our top three buckets that we're looking at. Um, but ultimately the, the plan itself has has tons of strategies within those kind of spaces of how we move forward. Um, okay, so how do we, we've got these big ideas, right? We wanna reduce food waste. We wanna reduce construction and demolition waste. These are our target areas, but how do we do that? Um, so that's what my team does. Uh, we take the strategies that are in the zero waste master plan and we identify, we start evaluating them and how we can potentially move these forward. So first we wanna look at we're gonna start with that prioritization process. We're gonna look at what, what's the biggest bang for our buck? How much can we divert um, you know, in terms of uh, tonnage? How much material can we keep out of the landfill? What things, what strategies can get us a high diversion as well as what strategies also are gonna have a major impact on reducing our carbon emissions. So that's where we kind of the space where we start. Um, but then we have to look at all these other factors. Um, I think us, as uh, sustainability professionals and all of you as sustainability um, just advocates or, or wherever you live in the sustainability space, 
We want to say, move this forward, do this thing. We all know what needs to be done. Let's just do it. Um, but you have to look at so many other factors and that's where, what my, my team does. And we look at one, of course, you have to look at political will. It's always going to be, you know, the mayor's coming, you know, elections are coming up. Who's going to support this? Who's not going to support this? Um, do we have the political will? Do we have the public support to move something forward? Then we have to look at the cost and capacity to manage something. Um, you know, one of the biggest things in the zero waste master plan is moving us to um, a system of a fee structure. Right now, all of solid waste, we are funded from basically um, property taxes, sale tax, sales tax that's coming to the city's general fund. We compete with schools, we compete with fire, we compete with health. Um, and I sometimes look at uh, at things like recycling or these waste aversion um, activities. Sometimes it feels like um, art class in high school, football is always going to come first and art is going to get cut. So, you know, trash collection and, you know, public health is always going to come first. Um, so the health department, schools, the education of our kids those things do come first, our protection. Um, but we have to have a space for this to move forward. And really the waste that we generate is more like a utility. So that's really what this plan um, advocates for is for us to move to a system where we pull ourselves out of that general fund and we establish funding for um, a fee system for, um, for waste and disposal and recycling. Um, specifically a pay as you throw system is what they recommend, which essentially is incentivizing folks to recycle more, incorporate composting, um, and then you just pay for your trash where you're not paying as much for those other um, those other services. So it really incentivizes diversion. Um, but cost, cost is a huge bit. Do we have the cost to, to do this? Do we also have the capacity, meaning staffing? Um, we have to have staff. We have to be able to make sure that we're managing anything we try and move forward, um, and we have the people to do that. A great example is right now cardboard is banned from trash containers. Do we enforce? We don't have the staff to, to enforce that. So while it's banned, um, some people know that most people don't. And so that while it's a, a law that is on the books, it is not necessarily effective. So we have to look at when we're addressing all these strategies, can we implement this in an effective way? And that does require some of these things. Um, and then once we kind of get that all in line, and figure out, okay, what can we do? What are we, what are we going to go after? The next step is research and planning and how do we do it right? Um, and so to note, uh, to bring this home a little bit, um, I'm just going to talk about really quickly our top strategies, the things that we've identified, the things that we we're actively working on. So one, um, every other week, I know you've heard it. I know you're going to ask me when, when are we going to every other week recycling collection? Um, we are actively working on it um, and we were, uh, our target is quarter one of 2023. We don't have a date yet. There's been all kinds of issues that live in that space. I was just talking about and cost and capacity and all these things that we've been trying to work through, but um, we are working towards every other week. Um, but also one question we get is multifamily recycling. So we have our recycling programs, but what about expanding those programs? So one thing that we're starting is we've started uh, reaching out to peer cities and looking at universal recycling ordinances. Um, takes a lot of capacity, I'll tell you. We found out from uh, Austin that that does this pretty successfully um, that they have six staff members to manage that program. Um, so we have to look at that, but it's something we are actively looking at and researching. Um, that's kind of a big research project for us for 2023. Um, food waste is another big one that I mentioned. Um, and we are looking at pilots to be able to um, identify what are we gonna need to make a citywide food waste collection program. Right now we have a wonderful compost company facility out in Ashland City. They do wonderful work to um, turn all of our food scraps into beautiful compost. If we started requiring compost collection or did comp citywide compost collection tomorrow, there'd be nowhere for that material to go. So we have to, I, um, our goal is to do some pilot programs to identify what's going to be the capacity, what's going to be the participation, what's going to be the need to make that an effective program citywide so that we can have the data to support moving a program like that forward. Um, so we're in process of that and hoping to do um, a pilot for residential collection, hopefully in 2023 is the goal. Um, pay as you throw, as I mentioned, uh, we're currently in a cost of service study. 
So that's where we're at with um, moving towards, we have to understand what our costs are before we can even look at how do we move this entire system of how we're funded. Um, so it's important to just understand what our, our service costs are. So that is currently underway. Um, but ultimately, if we were able to at one point move to cost uh, to a pay as you throw system, we would get to um, incentivize residents again to recycle and compost. And with that, I am going to turn construction and demolition because this is really the space that we have been pushing for. Um, I'm going to let Allie Omens pop in and hopefully take up less time talking than I have because I just looked at the time. <laughs> Hey, I'll, I'll just say uh, really quickly that yes, construction and demolition waste is a major focus for our team and that is driven by the zero waste master plan by these, uh, these goals and these strategies. Um, construction and demolition waste, C and D, as we refer to it, it's very bulky, it's very heavy. I know we all get caught up. I feel myself getting caught up in you know the packaging that we deal with day in and day out. Um, but when we take a look around at the buildings we're standing in, the homes that we um, live in, our apartments we um, that we live in, you know, those buildings, if they're taken down, where does that material go? Right now, our baseline for Middle Tennessee, for, uh, for Nashville specifically, is sending a lot of that material to landfill. Um, and so what we've done is start by uh, by educating, right? You know, the, the education before putting in requirements to say uh, builders in this area, uh, partners that we have, you know, folks that are in that building community that are driving zero waste and have those goals in their companies. Um, we've been actively engaging them to develop our, um, and I know we had a question in the chat about enforcement. One of the priorities in the zero waste master plan is to enforce diversion of construction and demolition waste. And that uh, requires us engaging partners in again, in Middle Tennessee to see how that could look for our city, as well as looking at peer cities uh, and happy to talk on this to at, at length um, at another point. But yes, construction and demolition waste, it's uh, very exciting, especially to think about uh, large projects, large projects that are going on um, that we all see, you know, we see the cranes when we drive uh, through the city. And so we're looking at Right now we're doing the education and then how would it look to enforce diversion on those projects and start seeing a major diversion of that waste stream. Uh, right now it's estimated that we have estimated that 38% is uh, of our waste stream is construction and demolition waste. We are assuming that that is a major under uh, underestimate of that waste stream. Those numbers are a bit outdated. Um, and so it's it's a big part of our, of our waste stream and uh, a big focus of mine as well. I will okay. yeah. let Thank you both you, take Alex. it from there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's just a really good point is that, you know, she brought it home to explain 38% of our waste is construction and demolition. So that's a focus. It's a huge focus and, and where we're, we're putting our, our efforts. Um, our next question came in and I'm going to speed through a little because um, I've been a little overly winded on these, but our next question came in just more about recycling education. I think folks, uh, it's very clear. I get the questions a lot. Well, I see my neighbor doing this. I see somebody not recycling right. And there's concerns that there's not a lot of education or enough education going out. Um, and I want to first note that, yes, we education is huge for us. Uh, we are looking at opportunities to increase our education and getting out to more people all the time. Alleys are a big concern. They're very complicated. But that's why we look at grant opportunities. It's why we're looking at how we can train our staff better, um, especially in 2023 is something we're looking at training staff. <clears throat> it's why we have programs like this for peer-to-peer -peer education. Um, so yes, definitely need to do more education and we look at that. But I also just want to highlight for those of you that are have that angst over oh, the, that my neighbor just put plastic bags or they just bagged all their material. Um, yes, we want to get to those people. We want to educate them. But one, recycling, again, is not the answer. The less material we can generate in the first place is going to be the best. But then also statistically, in 2020, 46% of our curbside recycling was not recyclable. That's appalling. It was unfortunate. But in one year's time, the education that myself and my staff did brought that down to 28%. And then in over the next year, in 2022, our recent audit, that is now down to 21.6%. 
So the reality, when you look at the data, is that we actually aren't doing that bad with our recycling program. Education is getting out there, and we are statistic we are dropping our contamination rate, which means that we are increasing the good amount of good recycling that's coming in, increasing our diversion, as well as also saving taxpayer dollars through that education that we're doing. So while it might feel like there's not enough, yes, we can always be doing more, but also know that education is statistically proving that we are headed in the right direction and are being successful. And we're only a few percentage points away from the national average in terms of our contamination rate for our programs. So we are in good shape um, with, uh, with that. And if you have other questions about education, we can put those in the chat and I will circle back with you, but we are on track, but we're gonna do more. And with that, I think our next question here is, uh, is Christina. Yeah. So thanks so much, Jen and Allie. This has been great. Um, we are right at 1 p.m. Um, we thought it was going to be a shorter episode, but we were I just know. like having a great time. Um, so we are going to go through to the 1.15 end time that we always use. Um, so folks, if you can stick around for the last 15 minutes, we would love that. We're going to get to a couple of more of those questions that we had. Um, if not, we'll see you in the new year. And we really thank you um, for sticking around um, for this hour. So one of the questions that we got was kind of about businesses and institutions, even churches, um, and if they are doing any kind of sustainability work, how do we check in on that? What does it look like? Um, so that's a pretty, excuse me, pretty general question. Um, so we wanted to give you a couple of different avenues to, to look into um, so you can kind of deep dive into that um, on your own. Um, and again, if there's things that you really want to see um, next year for a full, full episode, that's also why we're doing this. We're not trying to kind of not answer these questions. We're really just trying to see what are you interested in learning more about um, and where can we point you in the right direction. So this is one of those ones that I think is a good one to start with. Um, so if you're interested in a particular company in particular, you know, we can't really do the research on every single company and, and kind of give a report for y'all. Um, but if you want to just Google or whatever your search engine is, um, sustainability and the company, a lot of times that will bring up um, a whole page of what they're doing. Obviously, look at that with a lens of you know, what are they actually doing? Are they greenwashing? How are they actually reporting that? And really kind of go through it um, with a critical eye. But there are some organizations that kind of help you think through that as well. There's the Climate Action Tracker, which is more of a broad scale kind of global tracker of how folks are doing with their pledges that they've made at kind of like the national level. Um, so that could be a nice one for you to kind of tap into as well. Um, and then there's also the CDP. Um, so that is the Carbon Disclosure um, Project. And they now go by CDP. And basically what they do is track organizations goals and metrics specifically. So that could be a really cool one for if you're interested in what those folks are actually doing to really take a deep dive into that. And so hopefully we'll have that in the chat for you um, to look into because every single organization is going to be different. They're gonna have different metrics that they're using because um, there really is no kind of gold standard that folks should be following, um, which would be something that we would obviously love to see. Um, and then there are some good certifications that we want to kind of point you to that are kind of trusted. Um, if you're looking to, to follow um, an organization or, or to support them, um, B Corp is a really good one. So that's really like businesses that are trying to do good. Um, and what's really cool is our organization is now kind of stewarding B Tennessee. So that is the Tennessee version of B Corp. Um, we're going to be having some cool fun things happening in 2023 around that. So I encourage you to look at our, our webpage. And if you are a business who is interested in that, or if you just want to see who to support, um, that's a really great one. And then there's also, um, and I'm going to be talking about that in just a second, Jen, thank you for sharing that. Um, oh, lead is great. BPI for compostable is awesome. Um, Forward Stewardship Council. Those are all ones you can trust um, that show you that they have been kind of vetted for the things that they say that they're doing. People can say that they are natural or they're green or, or some of these words, um, but if they're not actually certified, it's kind of hard to know if they're actually doing that work. So just, just trying to make sure you do a little bit more of that homework and hopefully those resources help you. Um, closer to home, which is what Jen is showing right now, um, we have our Urban Green Lab certification program. And what this is, is really, um, you do a lab assessment, it's free, it's online, you can do it right now um, for your institution, your school, your business, your church, and really see if you're kind of meeting these standards that we think are um, really great for sustainable education within your organization. Um, people like the library and DeVita are a part of this program here in, in Nashville, and we're continuously growing um, that group of certification organizations. You can do things like 
um, strategic planning. Um, so you get sustainable education, you get that assessment, one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, so we just really want to kind of tell you that if you if you are any of those types of organizations and you're looking for more sustainable education geared right to you and your organization, um, to look into that and it might be a great way um, for you to feel like you are doing your work um, towards making Nashville more sustainable. Um, so that was just a kind of a quick question for that more general question that we have. Um, and then Jen is going to take it over now and make sure that we answer a couple of those tree questions because we got lots of tree oh, yeah. questions as well. Um, and then we'll start to kind of wrap it up okay. with a, a few um, loose ends and then we'll send you all on your way. Yeah, so trees definitely always getting um, tree questions. I'm going to try and run through this uh, really quickly. So first off, we had some questions about free trees. Um, <clears throat> in a nutshell, the city metro uh, government, we do have a tree bank program uh, that is uh, providing free trees that are, well, they're not necessarily free, but they are paid for by metro government that are be being planted in public right of ways, as well as on uh, public property. Um, so that is um, an opportunity if you have, uh, know of any areas, reach out to your metro beautification commissioner. Um, Allie can send that link for you all in the chat on how to reach out to your beautification commissioner. Um, We'll be able to connect you with that program but then also if you're looking free for free trees for your um for your personal property there is some money that was designated for planting trees in on private property and that's being managed by the cumberland river compact um so reach out to them uh and their tree captain um it's not just they have a, a system of how they are doing that but they'll be able to direct you in the right place cumberland river compact I also encourage you to go back and watch our episodes on trees because that was discussed quite a bit. So there's gonna be some more information there. Um, but those two resources, Cumberland River Compact and your Metro Beautification Commissioners are a great place to start for free trees. Um, we also had some questions about the Emerald Ash Borer, which there's a, a webinar or some talks on our Metro Beautification YouTube playlist that uh, specifically are just talks on Emerald Ash Borer. Um, there was some concern though about, I think, um, about how Metro is managing the emerald ash borer trees. So I did reach out to some of our staff um, because we are doing a lot of tree removal where trees are going to put potential people in harm's way. Um, so folks asked, why are we not treating them rather than, um, than uh, removing them in terms of the costs? Um, and so the cost, it can cost maybe 1500 bucks to remove a tree, um, but treatment is, um, there's kind of some misunderstanding about the cost of the treatment. And the treatment is $20 per inch of diameter of a tree, and it's administered every other year in perpetuity of the life of these trees. Um, so if you think about that, you're taking a 20 inch diameter tree, uh, if you just look at 20 years of treatment, that's $4,000 already just for that one tree, uh, as opposed to the $15,000 or $1,500 removal um, fee. So we are looking at this from a financial perspective. I mean, when you look at it, we have, um, what is it, uh, 16,000 trees that are targeted for this removal. So that's, it's a lot of trees to manage, but we are replanting. Um, so we are looking at the treatment. It, uh, and the cost benefit analysis is going to make more sense to unfortunately to take those trees down so that they don't put people in harm's way and then just replant. Um, and then there were some really interesting questions about tree ordinances. We do have a tree ordinance here in um, Nashville, but it doesn't necessarily impact. Um, it incentivizes uh, saving mature trees, but it doesn't necessarily require or put any requirements around saving mature trees. <clears throat> Um, essentially, developers have to meet a certain tree canopy, um, and they can do that with mature trees, or they can do that with new trees. They just get um, more credit for those mature trees, and then if they can't meet that, they put money into that tree bank that I mentioned that does the public um, uh, plants trees on public lands. Um, I will note, because there was some interest in mature tree ordinances, um, and uh, there has definitely been some interest from folks in my department and water services, not in waste, but in the water services side, um, in stormwater, as well as um, nonprofits. Um, I think the Tree Conservancy and some other folks that are looking at doing some ordinances. Um, but it's just important to note that moving those things forward, especially with something that deals with private property, 
Um, there's a, you know, you're going to have some push and pull between the nonprofits and the public that want to see these trees stay, but also making sure that the, the legislation is um, maybe not infringing too much on private owners' property rights. Um, so there's definitely some push and pull there and some play to move something like that forward, but the city is looking at it I, um, or leadership and um, different groups are looking at it. And then Christina, you had done some other research, right? Yeah, so while Jen looks up um, or gets up the Metro code and how to look up your council member um, information, I just wanted to kind of real quick, someone had asked if there was any interesting ordinances from other cities that we might want to look into. And so if that was you and you were interested in that, um, Jacksonville, Florida and Florida in general um, had just like an interesting one that I found about exceptional specimen trees. Um, and so that's something that either this like a state champion or the American Forestry Association can actually designate certain trees because of its size, age, historic association, um, ecological value, basically their unique and intrinsic value can actually be designated for, for saving as well. Um, and so that could just be an interesting one for you to look into um, if that's something that you're, you're really interested in. Um, but when we want to talk about tree ordinances as well, um, you can also start thinking about um, the heat mapping data that we got um, as a city, we just recently did some heat mapping, which really has to do with kind of tree cover as well. Um, and so if you're interested in that, you can kind of tie that in if you're ever talking to folks about the importance of trees. We need trees for equity and shade. And, um, and so we can kind of tie it into that. Um, and you can go back and look at our Urban Heat Island um, episode that you folks already told us that you liked. Um, but if you want to actually contact your council people and talk to them about ordinances and changes that you want to see, um, Jen's going to walk you through that. That to make sure that you know how to look that up. Yeah, it's really simple. So um, Ali put this uh, link in the chat and of course we'll send it afterwards. But if you're not sure who your council member is, you just go to their um, Metro Council website and then you enter your address. Um, so I'm just going to put in an address. No, it is not my home address. <laughs> Don't come knocking on my door. Um, but you'll see it'll pull up the district and then you can click on that and it'll pull up your information and any meetings that they might have. So it's really easy if you don't know your council member, know your council member, reach out to them, get on their newsletter um, if you're really interested in getting more involved in the legislative process and um, policy process. Um, and then the other one was the Metro Beautification Commission. They just have a list of their membership here on their website, but their uh, main point of contact is JD Lane. He was also a guest on one of our episodes. <clears throat> Uh, talking about litter. So he manages the Metro Beautification um, program from a staff perspective, but you can look up your local commissioner um, here as well. So either one of those resources are going to be good for you if you're looking um, for anything trees, but then also really anything recycling, cleanup, beautification, or legislation. These are both really great resources to have and to know who, um, who's who and who you can reach out to. Yeah. Awesome. And so for the last couple of questions um, we have here, we're going to go through them real quick. Um, and then we're going to hear from you at the last second about what you want to see in 2023. So keep thinking about that. Um, we had some questions about the NES solar panels um, and whether or not they were kind of worth um, purchasing. So basically you can lease solar panels, even if you're in um, a rented home and you don't actually have to have the panels on your rooftop. Um, they have it out in um, on a old landfill basically um, that they opened up in 2018 that has solar panels that they essentially turn on when you lease them. Um, so there is an incentive for you to, to lease these um, panels so that they turn on and that they're actually feeding energy into the grid. Um, they have 2,807 customers have already leased those solar panels and they have over 13,000 more um, that can be leased. And so even if this wasn't a situation where they were turning them on um, because you're leasing them, even if they were already kind of generating, it's still really good to use your purchase power to show the government and to show NES um, that this is something that you want as a consumer, that you want clean energy in your grid, um, that this is important to you. And so really using your dollars to move the needle on that. There's ways that you can get it for yourself. You can gift subscriptions and you get credits on your um, bill. So we do really do encourage you to do that if that's something that you're interested in, especially if you're not able to put it on your house yourself. Um, and so the uh, last question that we had, and 
it, it's a little bit of a tough one. It's clothing recycling. And so clothing recycling is notoriously difficult. Um, less than 1% of clothing is actually recycled to make new clothing. Um, it's just really, really difficult to actually take that, that material and make it into clothing again. Patagonia does some really great stuff um, with recycled fibers, soles for shoes, um, takes old shoes and helps folks in the global south turn that into a business of repairing and reselling those shoes. Those are some good examples, but really if it's going to be recycled, it's probably going to be turned into carpet or padding and basically lesser quality material. Um, and so the idea behind that is that because everything that we wear is often made of mixed materials, a lot of time has plastic in there, it's really hard to pull those materials apart and then to reuse them. Even if you have things like wool or cotton, it's still really hard to actually get those to not degrade. The, the, the industry is just not there yet. Um, we don't have really the, the um, we, we do have a market in a way, but we don't really have um, the, the uh, materials needed to be able to turn those into to new, um, um, clothing pieces. So when you see that people are recycling it, it I don't want you to think that you're actually turning that into new materials to be worn again. Um, and so there are some things that we say where you can drop it off at some fast, fast fashion stores. Um, and really that came from because they got in trouble because they were burning and throwing away kind of the, you know, the next season would come in, people either return things or they weren't buying them and they were just throw them away or burn them. And they kind of got some really bad publicity. Um, so they started to put in these boxes into their, into their, um, stores. So if you use those, again, just know that they are probably being, you know, sent somewhere, but they're really just going to be used in like mechanics as rags. They're going to be um, used in animal shelters. They're going to be used um, in maybe like a goodwill type of situation. And those are all things that you can tap into as well. If you see those boxes or if you see an organization like Retold or um, TerraCycle that we can't you know, vouch for and say you should pay for their subscription, but basically what we can say is they are being a middleman for you. So if you don't have the time and the resources to really pick through all of your clothing and materials, you might wanna consider doing something like that and donating it because then they'll on the back end figure out where to put all those materials. But just know that they're not likely being turned into new clothing. They're really being downgraded into something that can be used you know, at an animal shelter or as rags. So it's still really great to use options like that if you can. Um, but the biggest thing is to try to get materials um, that you can use for long periods of time that are made of good quality if you can, to take care of them, washing them on cold. Um, don't wash things that are delicate with zippers and buttons. Um, trying to hang dry your clothes if you can instead of putting in the dryer, some things that will just keep a longevity of your clothing. Um, and just trying not to really kind of do those impulse buys, trying not to buy like three shirts in one color, trying them on and then sending them back. So just making simple changes like that. The question also mentioned baby clothes. Of course, that's a little bit harder to kind of, you know, buy for longevity. But what I would encourage you to do is like those buy nothing groups, um, especially on like Facebook and things like that. You could be really helping out a family in need who can't buy these materials, um, but would really be excited to have some gently worn clothes that another child was using. So really, there is there is a gap in this. This is something where if you're really passionate about it, you know, keep doing the research, keep trying to fill that niche. Um, there are lots of groups that are trying to fill the niche, you know, as we go. Um, there's an example in New York City of a company called Fab Scrap who takes those like textiles from um, like people who make uh, clothing and they actually, you know, there's no real market for those. And they created a whole business around recycling that, sending it to schools and other artists to use in kind of fun, creative ways to keep it out of the landfill. So that might be what you want to do is jump on that bandwagon and actually fill a niche. But also, I just want to end on the fact that we really espouse here at Sustainable in the City a no shame sustainability journey. There's no way that you can be a perfect sustainability person. There's no way that you can tie up every loose end that you see, everything that's kind of making you feel that guilt inside that you're not doing enough. You are one person. We want you to do as much as you can, make as many sustainable actions as you can, when you can, when you can afford it, when you can make that decision, and try to leave the guilt um, behind in the new year um, when you can't make those perfect decisions. So fill that niche if you can, 
keep doing that research, keep reaching out to us and we will keep trying to find the answers for you. But really know that you have um, your power of purchase, you have resources that we've shared, you can talk to your elected officials, but just try to release that, that idea that you have to be perfect in order to talk to folks about the work that you're already doing. We know that you all are sustainability champions. We can't wait to keep learning with you in the new year. Um, if we, I'm going to send in the follow-up a Venn diagram where you can really um, get to know your skills, get to know what brings you joy, and get to know kind of where you fit in this puzzle of sustainability because we can't all do everything. And so we really want to encourage you to find the thing that kind of brings your spark, that, that uses your skill set, um, and, and kind of run with that. And we would love to hear about it in the new year. We're gonna end on a word cloud. I'm not sure if we have everyone still sticking around, but if there's anything that you wanna see in the new year, any topics that you want us to make sure that we have episodes on, please let us know. Um, we're gonna put that up right now as we're ending. We have transportation, sustainable actions, unique projects. I like that, like showcasing unique projects that we have. Mm -hmm. Um, so we are very, very excited to keep learning with you in 2023. Um, and we, we will go through that chat and make sure that we see if there's any kind of through lines that we can, we can make an episode around as well. And again, I will just throw it out there for those recycling questions. We will have a lot of time, a lot more time during that recycle right presentation on January 5th. So if you have a chance to join that, please do, cause, uh, we'll be able to answer some more questions about recycling live at that time. Oh, we've got another one. More on youth. Uh, absolutely. Um, recycling plastic bags. Again, I would say join that January 5th episode. We'll definitely, um, we'll dive more into just recycling and, and basics and what have you. But keep popping those in there. We are, are we're over time. I cannot believe it. Uh, I can a little bit because I, when I start talking recycling and all these things, there's too much in there and I want to share it all. Uh, so hopefully, um, though you have come away from today, hopefully with your, Christina's wonderful uh, close uh, to our episode that no shame sustainability. I really love everything about that because you're only, I totally agree. You're only one person. Do your best. Um, and I, I hope everyone has a wonderful, as sustainable as you can, new year. Um, we're going to end it on this and hope to see you in 2023. As a reminder, we will not have an episode in January. We will be joining you back the second uh, February, second Wednesday in February. So that's February 8th. So you'll hear from us probably sometime in January, but we'll be taking that time to do some planning. So as we do that, send us um, anything that you'd like to see in the new year. And with that, we cannot appreciate you all enough for your time with us over this past year. I know many of you watch many of these episodes. So thank you for being here and have a wonderful rest of your year and happy holidays to everybody. Hi everyone. Thank you. Bye.